Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Law Sessions. My name is Samuel Senyonjo. And this morning, we are still going on with the law of contract. And specifically, we are doing capacity to contract. Uh, this is part two of capacity to contract. Last time, we handed minors and capacity to contract. So now, today, I'm going to be handling uh, intoxication in regard to capacity to contract. I also talk about sanity and then corporations in regard to capacity to contract. One, what is capacity to contract? Capacity to contract is the ability of the parties to contract to appreciate the contract, the terms, the rights, the duties of a contract. So if someone has that capacity, if they can appreciate the terms of the contract, then in law we are going to presume that that person has the capacity to contract and the same is going to be bound by the contract. If they cannot understand the terms of the contract at that particular moment or at that momentous epoch when the contract is made, then they don't have the capacity to contract. Now, last time we talked about children or minors, and those are persons below the age of 18. And the Constitution gives an exception in regard to contract of work. And it says, uh, for purpose of contract, or that we call it a contract of service, for service, the minor can contract if the same is 16 years. So if the, the same is 16 years, they can contract, though, again, uh, the Children's Act goes on, the rules for Ch Children's Act goes ahead to provide for, the, for that particular work in which they can contract. The same must be light work. It must be light concerning the children. And that is what we call capacity to contract. So the children can contract if it is a necessity. If the goods or the services are for necessity goods or necessity services, then the children can contract. If they are not, then they may not. We went on and on. You may look for, the, for that first video on capacity to contract. And now today I want to handle something new that is about the corporations, intoxication, and insane. Can insane persons contract? I think that is kind of rude. Can persons with mental incapabilities contract? Can they contract? What about persons who are intoxicated? Can they contract or they cannot contract? That is what I'm going to be handling today. And then, mental competence is very crucial. If a person is not found competent to, to contract or to make a contract, then the contract is void all voidable at the expense of that person who was not competent. So if um, I'm insane and I contract, I did not understand the, the terms of the contract, then I can move out of the contract or I can choose to ratify it. So co capacity to contract is very, very, very crucial. Why? Because you must be able to understand the terms of the contract that you are entering into. So, mental capacity is very crucial. They must appreciate the terms. They must know what the they must know the, what the the agreement they are entering into. They are signing whether agreement for for a job, whether agreement for a sale of a property, whether agreement for what. As long as it is an agreement, as long as it is a contract, in order for it to be binding on them, they must be mentally capable of understanding what they are entering into. Hope I'm clear on what amounts to capacity to contract. That is the ability to understand the terms of the contract. Law is very interesting, and I'm encouraging you to go on and on and on to study about what we call the law. It is crucial, and uh, we have a saying that ignorance of the law is not a defense. If you don't know about a particular law, uh, it is not a defense. You cannot say, I didn't know. Why? Because it is, it is gazetted, it is there. 
So it is incumbent upon you to know what the law says about a particular subject. So uh, we chose actually to begin with contract because it is day to day. We, we, we do it every day. We do it every day, every other time, every other week. We do contract. And now you need to know about capacity to contract. As you're going to contract with the persons, you may contract with a person who is toxic, who is intoxicated, who is insane, who is lunatic. So, what are you going to do if they come up and they tell you that, no, I am insane, or I was insane by that particular time when we made the contract. So we shall also look at the remedies. How can the law help you out if you contracted with an intoxicated person, a person who was insane, or a corporation? And I think I'll go on to give the examples of those persons, and I'll give you takeaway or homework to look for the meaning of those particular words. Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Uh, now, mental incapacity is provided for under, if you have your, your Contracts Act, it is provided for under Section 12. Of. Now, the general rule is that Every person has capacity to contract. That is the general rule. Every person has capacity to contract. But as I told you last time, every general rule has what we call exceptions. What are exceptions? Uh, I, I, I can give you an example of those exceptions. If we have a society and they are saying that women are not supposed to put on trousers, then exception may be. Uh, but... Those who are working in women, those persons who climb the trees, if they are women, they are supposed to put on. Then we, we may have other exceptions. Uh, policemen, I mean police women, are ex exempted. They can put on. Why? Because of the nature of their jobs. So we always have exceptions in law. We have exceptions, always we have exceptions, but you just need to know what is the general rule. The general rule is that concerning capacity to contract, every person has capacity to contract. They can contract, they can enter into a contract, they can trade, they have capacity to contract. Uh, however, we have some exceptions. So one of the exceptions is the insane persons, those with mental incapabilities, those with mental challenges. So they cannot contract. And uh, the examples of those persons, look for the word lunatic, idiots, those with, with hallucinations, amnesia, dementia. Those are examples of uh, mental incapabilities. You know those persons with amnesia, they can forget. But look for those particular words. Uh, got get to understand them. What is the difference between lunatic and an idiot? Who is a lunatic person? Who is an idiot? Then a person with amnesia. A person with hallucinations. Look for them. Those are examples of persons with mental incapabilities. Hallucinations, dementia, amnesia. So look for them. Those are examples of persons with mental incapabilities. They are those persons, they can forget, more so when they are in their advanced age. They can forget. They may, may, they may even ask their grand, great grandchildren who they know, they knew actually, that who are you, what is your name? Even their children, they can ask their sons and daughters, who are you, I don't know you. They forget. So if you contract with such a person, what will happen? What will happen? Is it binding or not binding? That is what I'm handling. Now, so now, section 12, if you have your, your, your contracts act, give some exceptions. When that contract may be binding. One, if a person is usually a lunatic or an insane person, usually a lunatic or an insane person but by the time you made the contract he was sane he was okay to make the contract then the contract is going to be binding on that person if the person is usually insane 
But on that particular day you made the contract, on that particular day, hour and time you made the contract, that person was sane, was able to appreciate the elements of the contract, the terms of the contract, then that contract is going to be binding on that person. So, if you have such a person and you need to make a contract with that person, make sure that before you make the contract, that person is sane. That person has mental capability to understand the terms of the contract. Then they are not going to come thereafter to tell court that I was insane. If they were able to, to understand the terms of the contract, then they cannot come thereafter. Now, uh, another exception. If the person is usually or always sane, but at times is insane. So if you find that person when he's sane, when he's okay, mentally okay, when he's mentally okay, then you can make a contract with that person during the period when that person is sane, is usually sane, but at times it becomes insane or uh, it gets mental challenges, mental incapabilities. You can make the contract uh, during that period when that person is sane or is mentally able to understand the terms of the, of the contract. So you can make the contract. So if you make the contract, that contract is binding on that particular person. Hope we are together on that. So, the general rule is that every person can make a contract. But in certain persons, at times, that contract may not be binding on them. If at all, at the time you made the contract, that person was not so bad. That person was insane. He had mental malady or mental incapacities. Then they cannot make a contract. They cannot. Now we are going to look at the case of CF. You write CF, capital letter. Then you put imperial. I-M-P-E-R-I-A-L. Imperial. Loan. Loan. L-O-A-N. C-O for company. Versus stone, as in stone, S-T-O-N-E. It is a case of 1892. You close the brackets, 1892, you put one. One, as I told you, it stands for volume. And then QB, Queen's Bench. You put QB at page 599. So, in this case, the holding was that the contract cannot be binding if the other party who is saying is aware of the insanity of the other person. Now take this. The court is going to ask two questions. One, was the person who was entering into a contract aware of the insanity of the other person? The first question, according to that case of imperial loan, was the person aware of the insanity of the other person? Or not. Now, if I am bona fide, if I don't know about the insanity of the other person and we enter into a contract, then that contract is going to be binding on the other party. But, not this, if I am aware of the other person, maybe I want to take advantage of them, I'm aware of their insanity, then I enter into a contract, I buy, I buy their 100 acres. I'd say 10 millions. Why? Because I know they are insane. They are not able to understand the terms of the contract. Then that contract is going to be void ab initio. It is going to be null. It is, going to, it is not going to have effect on the other person. That, that contract is going to be void. It is not going to be binding. The courts of law are not going to rely on that contract. It is going to be rescinded. It is going to be put aside. Why? Because I was aware of the insanity of the other person. So now, beware. If you are entering into a contract, do not take advantage of the other person. If you know that they are, they are insane, one, first make sure that maybe today when I've come to make this contract, 
they are sane and they are not insane. Oh, they are mentally capable of understanding the terms of a contract. Then I've said there are two questions. That is the first question. The second, the second question is going to be, does the other person usually sane? At times, is he sane? Or is always insane? So court is going to ask, one, were you aware of the insanity of the other insanity of the other person? And then two, do you have moments when the other person is sane? Is okay, is mentally okay? Then if both questions are answered in the affirmative, then the, the contract is going to be binding on the other person who is usually sane. So those are the two questions the court is going to ask. As you contract, as you enter into contract, be mindful of capacity to contract. Be mindful of that. And now, another question I'm going to ask. Uh, when may this insane person or person with mental incapabilities going to be bound by the contract? Or when may they contract the, the, these insane persons? Like for the minors, the same principle applies here. If it is a necessity. So if it is contract for a necessity, then they are going to be bound. I gave examples of those necessity goods. The goods, all the, the things, the basics, you cannot go without them. You cannot go without food. You cannot go without health. Uh, even uh, legal advice was launched among them. It is one of the examples of, of the essential, the necessaries, the necessity services. So, if it is for clothes, food, shelter, uh, health, or legal advice, then that other person is going to be bound by the contract. So they can contract and they are supposed to give reasonable amount of money. Those are insane persons. But besides that, then they may not be bind if it is proved that at the time when they entered into the contract, they were not understanding the terms of the contract. So that case is a locus lascus case, that case of imperial loan, where it was held that provided the other person who is sane knows about of the insanity of this person, then the contract is not going to be binding. And in that same case, they developed two questions that the court is going to ask. One, are you aware of the incent of the other person? That is number one. Number two, uh, is the other person always sane or is always insane? If he's always insane, then the contract is not going to be binding. If at times is sane, then the contract is going to be binding provided by the time they entered into that contract, the person was sane. Now, what is the remedy to either party? Because I've entered, yes, well, I've entered into a contract, but now what, what is the remedy? What do I have to do? How is the court going to aid me on the same? I entered into a contract and this person is raising a defense that I was not able to understand the terms of the contract. We have two of them. We have two remedies. Remedy number one, to rescind the contract. That is at the option of this person who is at times insane. He has the remedy to rescind. So we have two remedies. Number one is uh, rescinding of the contract. This person who is always or who is uh, at times is insane, he can or she can opt out of the contract. Can say, at the times we made the contract, I was not able to understand the terms of the contract. I was insane. I mean, I had some mental problems. Insane is kind of rude. I had some mental problems. I had some mental incapabilities. I had mental malady. I couldn't appreciate what were the terms of the contract. So now they can rescind the contract. They can opt out of the contract. And that, that was held in the case of Matthew 
versus Baxter. Matthew is M A T H E W versus Baxter. Baxter is B A X T E R. The case is, was decided in 1873. Uh, it was heard that that contract is voidable at the expense or at the option of this person who was insane or, yes, who was insane at the time when the contract was made. So, if I'm the insane person, you bought my land, I'm the insane person and you bought my land, uh, probably at a takeout price, I wasn't able to understand the terms of the contract. When I come back to sanity, I can opt out of that contract. And we call that rescinding. Rescinding is to opt out. To make yourself not bound by the terms of the contract. We call it rescission or rescinding of a contract. So I can opt out of the contract. That is my remedy. If you are taking my land and I did all that, then I can opt out of that contract. That is the case of Matthew versus Baxter. Another remedy, uh, this is the second remedy. Uh, that person may ratify the contract. Ratification of the contract. If they come back to sanity, if they come back to no more, they can say, oh, well, uh, by the time we made this contract, I had some mental incapacities. I wasn't able to understand the terms of the contract. But look here, yes, the, co the terms of the contract are okay. And I'm putting a thumb onto them, onto the contract. So now, I'm bound by the contract. It is okay. Let's go on with the contract. That is what we call ratifying or ratification of a contract. Like, uh, as we shall study in international law, many contracts are made in Europe or in the UN when Uganda is not even there. So what we do, they do their meetings, they come up with or a protocol or any agreement, but Uganda has not been part. So what we do, we ratify the agreement. We sign on the agreement saying that you are going to be bound by that agreement. Even if we are not there, but you are going to be bound by that agreement. It happens even in the contract um, uh, on this issue of insanity. If I was insane, but now, yes, I'm okay. I can understand the terms of the contract, yes. And I'm saying the contract is okay. I can be bound with the contract. Then the contract is binding. Thereafter, the contract is binding. They cannot plead insanity if anything goes wrong. Why? Because now they are, in, they are sane, they can understand the terms of the contract, so they are bound by the contract. Hope we are together. What is capacity to contract? Ability to understand the terms of a contract. Mm -hmm. What is the general rule? The general rule is that Every person uh, can enter into a contract. Every person can contract. What are the exceptions? Exceptions, insane persons. Insane persons, that is an exception. Why? Because they may not have the mental capacity to understand the terms of a contract. So that is an exception to the general rule that every person has the capacity to contract. Now, if things go wrong, what are the remedies? The remedies we have, uh, the remedies we have, that particular person may seek to ratify the, the, the agreement or they may rescind the agreement. They may opt out of the agreement. That is what we call sanity and capacity to contract. Now, let me move on on another thing. Intoxication. Intoxication. So if person has boozed, has taken a lot of alcohol, they cannot understand the terms of a contract, then they are not going to be bound by the contract. So insanity can make the contract to be void or voidable. Insanity, sorry, intoxication can cause 
the contract to be void or voidable. Uh -huh. So if you are entering a contract with a person who is intoxicated, then what will happen? That person may opt out of the same. Reading that, I was insane. I was not able to understand the terms of the contract. Uh, so, intoxication can cause an effect to the brains. However, we have what we call self-intoxication. There are some persons, because they don't want to be bound by the agreement, what do they do? They self-intoxicate themselves in order to run away with the terms of the contract. You, you're one of those persons, let me go booze, let me go take off a lot of alcohol, and I'm going to uh, teach so-and-so a lesson. You Baganda people have that saying. Baganda people have a say, it's a saying or a proverb. Mbugambo uh, biwa mwengali sanga kumoyo. So, they want to teach you a lesson. What do they do? They go booze. They go take a lot of alcohol. Then they come back. They show you fire. They abuse you. That is called self-intoxication. So if you self-intoxicate your person, what is going to happen? What is going to happen? You are going to be bound by the contract. You don't need to self-intoxicate yourself in order to run away of the terms of a contract. So the terms of a contract are going to be binding on you. Uh-huh. You've had that. Now, if I enter into a contract with such a person, what is going to happen? If we go to courts of law, there are two questions, as I've told you. Uh, one, is the person able to understand the nature of a contract? One, is the person able to understand the nature of a contract? We have two questions if we go to courts of law. If we go to courts of law, the person is pleading, I was intoxicated, I couldn't understand the terms of a contract. The court is going to ask two questions. Uh, was the person, because now it was made in the past, was the person able to understand the terms of a contract? Question number two. Is the other person aware of the condition? Or was the other person aware of the condition of this person? So the test, the test for capacity to contract uh, in regard to insane persons and intoxicated persons, the test is, uh, is the person capable of understanding the nature of a contract? Two, is the other party aware of the condition of this person? Am I aware that you are intoxicated? That you've taken marijuana? All that, those things I don't know, Cuba. I hear Cuba, all that. Um, if I knew that you, indeed you are intoxicated, then I'm going to be liable. The contract is not going to be binding. The contract is not going to be binding on the other person who was intoxicated by the time the contract was made. Now be, beware, be careful as you are contracting. Beware and be careful as you are contracting. If the person is intoxicated, please don't make with them a contract. Yes. However, we have remedies. And those are the remedies. If you can prove to court that this person was sane, he could understand the terms of a contract, he was okay. He was very, very sober. He did this and this and this. That, th th these things cannot be done by a person who was not sober. He was able to understand even the money I gave him. I gave him, say, 10 millions. He was able to calculate the money, to figure it out. He knew. He knew 50,000. He could differentiate 50,000 from 20,000. So he was able to understand the terms of a contract. You know, in, in our court system, <laughs> Jovia Natami. Wow, wow. Thank you, Jovia Natami. Uh, you know, in our system, adversarial system, adversary, adversary comes like an enemy. An enemy. An enemy. 
Uh, if you are an enemy, mm -hmm. what do I do? If you are an enemy, what do I do? You are my enemy. So we call it adversarial system. Court of court system. We go in court. You be there, I be here. We battle. We battle. So mm -hmm, that is the, the, the role of the lawyer. You tell them their story. After telling them their story, they are going to, to tell court. The person was, was sane. It was okay. It was fine. By the time we did the contract, he understood the terms of the contract. He just wants to run, to run away from the terms of a contract, but he was sober. So that is intoxication. The remedies, like, uh, like the in Santa I've talked about, still we have two remedies. We have two remedies. It can be rescinded. You can, I can move out of the contract. I can choose not to be bound by the contract. We call it rescission or rescinding of a contract to, to, to abrogate it, to... to, to, to to tell, to tell the other part, I'm not, I'm not bound by this contract. I had a lot of alcohol on my head. I couldn't understand the terms of a contract. That is option number one. That is remedy on part of this person. But then we have another remedy, the voidable remedy. The voidable remedy, the contract where the contract is voidable, where the contract can be ratified. I can choose to ratify the contract. This intoxicated person can choose to ratify the contract and it is binding on them. If they choose to ratify the contract, what is ratification? I've told you, ratification is like when you come back to normal, after alcohol has gone, you come back to normal, after you coming back to normal, then you are going to tell court that, uh, not court, you're going to tell the other person that, uh, yes, yes, I was intoxicated, I had a lot of alcohol or my urine on my head, but now I can understand the terms of a contract, and you are well, it is okay. It is okay, the contract is okay. Now I ratify it, I sign it, I ascend to it. I'm saying that the contract is okay, we can, I can be bound by the contract. So that is the other remedy we have. Now, uh, that's, about, that's about intoxication. So an intoxicated person can make a contract and the contract is binding on them. If you can prove that by the time we entered the contract, the person was able to understand the terms of the contract. And the remedy to them, they can opt to move out of uh, their contract. Why? Because some persons are crooked. The, the contract may not be favorable to this other person who was, who was intoxicated. So they can opt out of it. Hope we are clear on that. We are handling capacity to contract. I've given you the two questions. In capacity to contract, the court, the, the court is going to ask two questions and those two questions, was the person able to understand the terms of the contract? That is question number one and question number two, was the other person who was said able, I mean was he aware that this person is intoxicated or insane? Then if they were aware, the court will go on to cancel, to cancel the contract. Now, on intoxication, there, there is this very, very inter interesting case. You may wish to put it down. It is Goa, G O R E versus Gibson versus Gibson. Gibson is G I B S O N. It is a case of eighteen forty-five. So in this case, the case is on intoxication. In this case, the court held that in order for, for it to cancel the contract, the other person has to prove that he was, or he, he or she was too intoxicated. The case of Goa versus Gibson, the case of 1845, the court held that in order to rescind that contract, any contract, the other person has to prove that he was too intoxicated. There are these persons who maybe take a bottle of wine and they want to pretend that they are so intoxicated, yet they are not, they understand everything. You know those persons who want to do a lot of things and are not fall liable? So, what the court held, this, this judge was very, very wise. He said that this person has to prove that he, was too, he or she was too intoxicated. If you are not too intoxicated, you are going to be bound. So, 
they are going to be bound if they were not too intoxicated they took just a bottle of wine and they are saying that oh i am too intoxicated no they are going to be bound that case of matthews versus baxter uh, yes, it talks about ratification. I've given it to you. It talks about ratification after you coming back to your normal senses, to your sanity. Then you can ratify the contract and you can say that mm, um, um, I'm, I'm bound by the contract. So that is, is it about the, the intoxication part of it. Intoxication, what amount to intoxication? You have to be too intoxicated to understand the terms of the contract. What are the remedies? We have rescinding of the contract. And number two, we have ratification of the contract. What are the two questions that the court is going to ask? One, uh, was the other person understanding the terms of the contract? And then two, was the other person able, was, was the other person aware that this person was intoxicated? If he was not aware, then he's bona fide. And the contract may be binding. So it is a case-to-case -case basis. And it is at the discretion of court. Now, let me talk shortly about corporations. Corporations are, are meaning companies and all that. Companies in law, a, a company is a person. In law, a company is a person. They have the legal capacity to contract. They have the legal capacity to sue or be sued. So if you enter into a contract with a company, and maybe they breach the terms of a contract, you can sue them through their name. Mark this, not this. You don't need to write everything, but write this, that a, a company is a, a person, is a legal person, or an artificial person. As I told you last week, last week, we have two persons. We have artificial person, and we have a natural person. So now, a company is a legal person. They can sue or be sued, but in their name. You have to look for that particular name in which the company was registered. If you don't sue them through their name, then the, court, the courts of law are going to say that is a non-existent company. So, let me give an example. We have Crown Beverages. That is not a company. I mean Pepys. That is not a company. The company is Crown Beverages. We have Coca-Cola. That is not a company. So, Crown Beverages is the, is the name or is the legal name for Pepsi Cola. Pepsi Cola is just a trading, a trading name. Are, are, we, are, we, are we clear on that? Uh, and then Coca-Cola is called Century Bottling Company. So, if you were to sue Coca-Cola and you sue, sue Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is not there. We have Century Bottling Company. So if you entered into a contract with Coca-Cola to supply them probably with something, and they did not pay you, if you are to go to court of law, don't sue Coca-Cola. Uh, Nalule versus Coca-Cola. No, you are going to sue Nalule versus Century Bottling Company. That is the Exist, that is the company that is existing in law. So, as you are going to sue the company, you need to be aware of what is the name of this company. What is the legal name of this company? So, in that name, you can sue or be sued. That company can sue or be sued. And is a person in law, they are liable. If you sue the managers of the company, if you sue the directors of the company, then you sue the wrong persons. In the near future, we shall study what we call civil procedure. And we shall exhaustively uh, talk about who to sue, what are the parties to, to this, to a case. We shall study that. But for this particular, let's limit ourselves to this, that the company can sue and it can be sued only in its name. If you do not sue it in its name, then the, it is negatory. It is because the company doesn't exist. That is about the company. So you can sue a company. What about partnership? What about partnership? Partnership has no legal capacity. However, it can sue through its members because in essence, partners are members. 
you cannot separate the, the, the partnership from the members. If the members of the partnership dies, that means the partnership is going to die. Unless the company, the company, the company lives in perpetuity. It can exist beyond its members. And that is why you are seeing Coca that Coca-Cola I've talked about. It has been here for years and years and years. And you have many companies. I, have, I had my friend, Murwana James. He passed on. He died. But the company is still going on and on and on. Nice house of plastics. It is still going on and on and on. Why? Because the company lives beyond its members. So unlike the company, partnership is intertwined, it is interlinked with the members. So if you are to sue in this case, you sue the members, the particular member. You sue the particular member. But if they were on business of the partnership, then the partnership can be liable. So beware, if you are dealing with a certain member and they were doing their own things, pertaining, they are not in the name of the partnership, you need to sue that particular person who breached the contract, who, who you made contract with. So the company can so be sued. The partnership is kind of different because you can separate the members from the partnership. This, the members can be separated from the partnership. And now, maybe let me add something little about the government. You can sue the government, uh, whether local government, local government has capacity to sue or be sued. You can sue the government. They have the capacity to sue. If it is a contract, because even governments enter into a contract. But what should we say? The law before was that, that you cannot sue the government through contract. Sometime back, I think, about a regime. But if you entered into a contract, because governments enter into a contract and they do not pay you, yes, they can sue and you can sue them. However, for the government, you sue what we call the attorney general. The attorney general is the lawyer of the government, is the representative of the government in legal matters. So the attorney general is the one to be sued because he acts on behalf of the government. You cannot sue President Museven, if the government entered into a contract, all super parliament, no, you cannot do that. They have a representative, and we take most of the cases to Attorney General. We take them to Attorney General. Why? Because he's the representative of the government. I know some of you are going to be very rich persons, and you are going to probably supply the government. Then you know who to sue and who to not to be sued. You cannot sue the president because the government did not give you this money. No, you sue what we call the attorney general because he's the representative of the government. So I conclude that the government has capacity to contract and you have the capacity to contract with the government. You can sue the government. And through attorney general, the government can sue you if it is a contract. Well, what about the local governments? The local governments are... Inco they are incorporated. They can sue or be sued. They are corporation. They can sue or be sued. You can sue the local government of Mukono, the local government of Wakiso, the local government of Kampala. They can sue you too because we enter into contracts with, with, with local governments. We enter into contract with them. I have my friend is always doing contracts with uh, Mukono local government. He always enters into contract with them. Now, if they breach the contract, if they don't pay him, they can sue. Are we clear about that? So they can sue or be sued. That is what we call capacity to contract. Also, in uh, civil procedure, if we keep together, we shall study it. But it, in the near future, it is, it is kind of in the future. It is kind of complicated. So we need to, to study the basics by the time we reach there then you, you, you are okay, you are familiar with some words, you are familiar with some courses, so it is not a shock to you. Now, I've, had, I've seen someone asking a question about persons who cannot read. Yes, you asked a question about who those persons who cannot read. Can I enter into a contract with such persons? Yes, you can enter uh, into a contract with such persons, but they have their act that protects them. They have their act they are protected by the act. I told you Uganda, I think, has 
some of the best laws in, in, the, in, the, in the whole world, though they don't work. They don't work, but actually have good laws. So those persons can enter. We, we have that act, Illiterate Protection Act. Illiterate Protection Act, it protects them. So the, if they are to enter into a contract, you have to make them understand the contract they are entering into. And at times we attach, we attach something. We attach a certificate of translation that we translated the contract and they were able to understand the contract. So if you are aware that this person I'm entering into a contract with is not familiar with this language, the language of the court, English, then you ought to interpret for them so that they understand everything. Actually, even for, for some of you who've went to courts of law, you've seen these court clerks interpreting to these persons. Why? Because they need to understand their liability, their rights. So if they cannot perceive, if they cannot understand English, then we ought to interpret for them. And we write what we call certificate of interpretation. So if you are entering into a person who is illiterate, who does not understand the language of the court, you ought to interpret the, for them. You ought to prove to court that this person indeed understood the terms of the contract. Are we together? Hope you are together. I've answered that question. If any other person has any other question, uh, we, 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 I'm going to answer. But I, today we are, we are winding up with capacity to contract. A uh, person with capacity to contract. So today we are winding up. So if you have any question pertaining capacity to contract, who has capacity to contract, um, uh, uh, I'm here to answer the same question. As you are thinking, if you have the question, I may give the summary of capacity to contract. Uh, capacity to contract, what is capacity to contract? Uh, capacity to contract is the ability to understand the terms of the contract. If you are able to understand the terms of the contract, then you have capacity to contract. That is number one. So if you've just come and you're summarizing who has the capacity to contract, the general rule is that every person of majority age has capacity to contract. If you are of majority age, I told you majority age is from 18 above. If you are 18 years, then you have capacity to contract with anybody, with any corporation, with government and all that. Now, another thing, that is capacity to contract. And that, I mean that is the general rule about capacity to contract. And we have what we call exceptions. Because my mental capacity is on two things. Number one, a minor. I told you uh, a minor is any person who is below the age of 18. If you are below the age of 18, you, if you have your constitution, you're going to read Article 34 of the constitution. So if you are below the age of 18, according to our constitution, you don't have the mental capacity to contract. You are a minor. You are a child. You cannot understand the terms of this contract because our constitution presumes that if you are 18 years and above, then you have the capacity to contract. If you are 18 years and below, you don't have the capacity to contract. You need a guardian. We call them guardian ad litem. Guardian ad litem. We have them. They can help you. Those guardians, those persons who can be there, who can understand, and then they can contract on your behalf. If you have... I want to go into that. I was, talking, I was going to talk about land, but we shall find it in the near future as we shall be talking about land law and family law. Most of family law and land law, that is going to be very, very interesting. And most probably, I think I'm going to take you through family law after contracts law. So now, if they are children, they cannot enter into a contract, they are minor. So mental capabilities on two things. Number one, majority, majority age, that is, if you're 18 and above. And number two, the, the state of the mind, the state of the head. What is the state of the head? If you are insane, you cannot contract. If you are intoxicated, you cannot contract. I've given you those examples of insanity, like uh, elucidations, like amnesia, uh, those things. Amnesia, we have idiots, we have lunatic persons. So those are some of the examples. You have dementia, 
So those are examples. They may enter into contract. I've said their contract is voidable at their expense. I mean, at their option, it is it is void voidable. Now uh, I've gone on to talk about corporations. The corporations, they are persons in law. We call them persons. So if I say this is a person and I'm meaning up company, please don't be shocked that Samuel has gotten some mental problems. No, they are, they are, they are able to contract their persons. So now, mental state is crucial. Mental and age. Age and mental, mental state of a person who is entering into a contract is very crucial. If they are too intoxicated and they cannot enter into a contract, please don't enter into a contract with them. Why? Because the contract is not going to be binding on them and maybe you're going to lose at the end of it all. So that is mental capacity. Now, I've gone on uh, to talk about the remedies. If you entered into a contract with such a person, what are the remedies that you have? And the remedies, you're going to go to court. After you're going to court, they are going to bring out two questions. One, question number one, was the, the other person, the other person was maybe insane or intoxicated, able to understand the terms of a contract or not? That is question number one. And question number two, were you, were you aware of, the, of this person that is insane or intoxicated or that? If you, are aware, if you were aware of the same and you went on to enter into a contract, then you are, the contract may be rescinded, it may be cancelled. Why? Because you were aware that this person is intoxicated, but you went on, maybe you are not bona fide. You, are, you, you never did it out of goodwill. You wanted to take their property, all that. You wanted to take advantage of them. So that is the remedy. The remedy is rescinding of a contract, and number two, ratification of a contract. Ratification of a contract is for the benefit of you, the same person, and rescinding of a contract is for the benefit of the insane person or that intoxicated person. Now, for necessaries, I've went on to say that if it is for necessaries, they are bound. Whether, whether they are minors, whether they are insane, whether they are intoxicated, they are liable. Why? Because these are necessaries. He was dying. Could he die? He was dying, so I had to give them food. We contracted for food. We contracted for we contract we contracted for a clothing, for health care, for for legal advice. They came into my farm for legal advice. I gave I gave them advice. So that is a necessity. That is a necessary necessary commodity. Uh, and those are the remedies that we have in law. That is those are the remedies. Uh, in this, uh, we have we don't have many cases, but read section 12 of, of the Contracts Act. I uh, read that case of Matthews versus Baxter. Baxter, it is the Locus Kilaskas case that uh, I saw. We have uh, read about read about what else? Yeah, that is it basically. Uh, the government, I've told you, they have the capacity to contract, and the corporation, they have the capacity to contract. The partners, I've talked about it that you may sue the partners. You have to, to know who you contracted with. I want to thank you for this morning that we are done with the capacity to contract. And tomorrow we are going to be handling something, we are going to be handling something different. We are going to be handling different, but we are still handling the elements of a valid contract. One of the elements of a valid contract is capacity to contract in order for for a contract to be valid, there must be capacity to contract. The persons contracting must possess the, the mental capacity to contract or their age must be of majority, majority age in order for them to contract. If they are minors, if they have my, 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 they, if they are minors, they may not be able to contract. Thank you very much. We meet tomorrow at the same time. Follow sessions.